welcome back everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show. Hmm, the guest today is me. You know, I get asked all the time, Julia, how do we find, recruit, keep next gen board members? It seems to be one of the hot topics, um, which makes sense because we have a lot of retiring uh, board members, but I get this question so often. I thought, you know what? We're going to talk about this in one of our episodes today. It kind of dovetails with a lot of things that are going on. And before we get started, I really want to make sure that I express my appreciation to our amazing sponsors. They include Blue Meringue, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. These people that you're seeing on the screen, and if you're listening to us, we have this amazing co-host panel. They come from all over the country. They're incredibly diverse, and I know you've uh, been able to meet them uh, for the last couple of months as we've been rolling them out. They are amazing. Hey, again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I also wrote the book, Building Board Champions. It launched this uh, early summer. And it's a really interesting um, path to activating your board members with some very simple and some complex ideas that allow the board to kind of grow, congeal, get rowing in the same direction as we like to say. And so I hope that you have an opportunity to pick it up. It's available from our friends at Amazon. And uh, it's been a really a fun journey to share with you basically three decades, I'm aging myself, uh, actually closer to four when I think about it, a board service throughout my community and your communities. Okay, so when we talk about recruiting next gen board members, which is such a big topic, and um, I could do this over a long weekend, believe it or not, but we don't have that much time on the nonprofit sh show, so we got to move through it. Strategy number one, you need to understand what is motivating the next gen leadership of our country. It is not the same as what was originally done with your cohort, right? Depending on your age, it is very different. And we know this intellectually, our times change, our people change, our cultures change, but this has been a time of momentous change, predominantly due to two things. One, social media and the way next gen folks get their information. And then another thing we don't talk about very much, but we are dealing with the largest population that has received the most education in our country, post-secondary education, masters, doctorates, certifications. These folks are super educated. And so they come at problems with a different thing. They also have fewer siblings. They have been seeing um, grandparents and parents age, and they have also been encumbered by a lot of student debt. And so all of these factors together really change the way they think about things, right? And so you need to kind of understand that. Um, these are not, a, 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 this is not a sector of our population that is necessarily um, having starting families early. They might be pet parents. Most oftentimes they are very invested in things of ecology and nature, and they really have a different take on what it means to be active in their communities. And so understanding what is going to attract somebody to be engaged in your nonprofit is a first strategy and it's a first start starting point. It's probably one of the, the tougher things to figure out. And so we put it as number one because this is not an easy task. But if you can figure this out, it will help you so much as we go through these next strategies. The next big thing that I think is really um, going to be a heavy lift for a lot of organizations is that next gen um, board members and just the demo, the demographics alone, they're very, very oriented to impact and data as it relates to the mission. So what does that look like? 
Next gen leaders are not going to come to you and work with you and support you and champion your nonprofit just because they feel charitable or they feel some sort of compulsion or guilt, or maybe it's what the family has already done, always done. That's not going to be something that they fly with. They're going to want to know their work and their mission is going to be rewarded with impact, which is very interesting, which means they're going to want to get reports. They're going to want to get data. They're going to be looking at the reporting out of what your organization does. This is a problem for a lot of organizations because we get so cranked up over what we have to do with programming that we don't take a step back and actually look at the metrics, analyze the data, and then understand how we need to communicate that out. Strategy number two is really going to be one of those things that impacts not only how you recruit next gen board members, but how you retain them. So let's say you go to meet with a prospective board member and they're maybe in their late twenties, early thirties, even possibly early forties. And you're going to want to talk to them about what your organization does and what it looks like and what board work looks like. The more data you have, the better it is going to be for everyone. That potential board member will be able to make a better decision. Can they support your mission? Can they meet the expectations that you have? Can they work in the spirit with which you need them to work and the full board needs them to work? But here's the kicker. As they navigate their journey through your board service, if they're not being communicated to with this information, these metrics, the data points, it's going to be hard for them to really see that what they're doing is important and that it has impact. It's not going to be enough for them to say, I'm doing the work of the angels and I do this tough work because it's the right thing to do. That charitable aspect, while I believe it's there, it's just defined differently, right? They want to see impact. And I'm not saying that this means you have a, found a solution to your mission, your problem, hands wiped clean and you move on down the road. That's not it at all. Because we know in the nonprofit sector that a lot of our work will never truly be accomplished, right? That we're just making incremental changes. And that's what this is all about. Strategy new, number two you must look at that alignment to mission, impact, and data. And when you do that, you're going to be able to not only recruit, but this is the thing that's even more important. You're going to be able to retain these next gen board members because that's what it's all about. You make these investments, they make investments in you, time, talent, and treasure, as we like to call it. You want them to stick all around and you want them to become a board champion, right? You want them to go back out into your community and advocate for your organization, which you're fully capable of doing and maybe even more robustly than some of your other board members because they connect with and to social media. And so that's one of those things that becomes really, really important. So let's move on to strategy number three. This is kind of an interesting one that I think a lot of times Folks don't really consider it. They think, hmm, this is odd. But we are seeing a huge interest of next gen leaders interested in mentoring and what I call that wisdom quotient. It doesn't have to be super, super formal. If you have an uh, emeritus board, which I hope you all do, uh, emeritus is Latin for old soldier, it is a board specifically designed to put your retiring or uh, boards, board members that have maybe timed out um, onto another structure so that you don't lose their enthusiasm. They might not meet very often, but oftentimes they will provide the service of wisdom and mentoring. Sometimes it is a link to the history of the organization, how a decision was made, what did your mission look like at a different point in time of history, especially for organizations that are old or have really been in service for a long time, this can be an invaluable piece of information. But more importantly, that wisdom, that mentoring, 
What does it mean to be an effective board member? Next gen board members come to you with a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of excitement, different and new perspectives, but let's face it, they probably have never served on a board before. So they're going to take a little bit of extra mm, handholding, if you will. And that's where that wisdom and mentoring piece can come in. I often think, too, strategy, strategy number three, that the mentor and wisdom piece also helps connect this next gen leader to other parts of the community. And while we look at ourselves in the nonprofit sector, a lot of times standing by ourselves, siloed, you know, we don't want to share what we've got with anyone else. This is something that can help you build more community leadership and community-based leadership. So ultimately, this is a strong thing. I also think that this wisdom and mentor piece can become highly effective when you have next-gen leaders who then start to build their lives, maybe relationships, marriages, family, home ownership, job change, everything that that older folks went through, there's a sounding board for that. This gives them the opportunity to go outside their family unit, seek some advice to find out how they can get it all done. How can they cope with this? How can they manage all of the things that it takes to work as a volunteer for a nonprofit board with all that responsibility? So strategy three, three connections to wisdom and mentors don't overlook that. That will become a piece that's incredibly, incredibly valued. Also, it cannot, it can also be external. It doesn't have to be internal. So for example, maybe that means you bring somebody in, you bring in somebody from the outside, you have a book group, you um, allow your organization leadership to, organizational leadership, I should say, to visit other nonprofits. Maybe they work in your sector, maybe they don't, but it's just that pursuit of knowledge and again, wisdom and mentorship, I think will take you very far. Strategy number three might be a bit of a surprise. Not everybody guesses that that's one of my top choices. Okay, got to talk about this. We've kind of lightly touched on it. Strategy number four, using LinkedIn to recruit with specific expectations. So what does that mean? I had a fascinating conversation with um, a, a man yesterday, not from my community, uh, from actually from the East Coast, who I think is just brilliant. And um, he brought up the, the fact that no one has ever tapped him on the shoulder to be engaged in board work. He's been engaged in his community. He's a community leader. He's a thought leader. And yet the specific ask of doing board service had eluded him. And so I asked the question to him, have you gone out into your community and said, I'm ready to serve? And what does that service look like? I'm interested in healthcare. I'm interested in education, whatever that might be. Have you defined that? And have you looked at what you believe you can bring to the table and what the expectation levels are? go the other direction. Let's say that you are looking at building your board or expanding your board or replacing board members. What is it that you're looking for? Do you need somebody with a financial background, a legal background, somebody of faith, somebody that serves in hospitality, somebody that serves in science? There's so many different things depending on the mission and the work of your nonprofit. So back up take a few steps and back and say, okay, what is it that we need? What's the expertise? If you go out onto LinkedIn, which is more of a professional social media platform, and you list what these expectations are, I think you'll find that you get some new voices in that are interested in board service from that next gen level. Again, LinkedIn is incredibly, incredibly value for this demographic, this millennial next gen demographic. And also, if you bundle this in with the concept of being very clear on what your expectations are, what your metrics are, and what you're looking for, I think you'll find tremendous success. So what do expectations look like? 
number of meetings, if you have a give or get, what your policies are. You know, some organizations will um, kind of draw a line in the sand and not allow their board members to serve on other boards for a period of time. Or they might have other committee requirements. They might have additional things that they want their board members to attend from galas and fundraisers to even trainings, right? So what does that look like? And how do you align that with potential board members that you're going to want to recruit? You don't want any secrets here. You don't want any surprises. You want to be able to clearly define what it is you're looking for, who's the type of person that's going to be successful and how that board is going to work with the addition of new talent. So sometimes when I talk about this, boards have been like, wow, we don't know what that looks like. So this might be the starting place for you and your organization. If you don't know what your recruitment parameters are, what the specific expectations are of your nonprofit board service, this is the place where you start. You don't have to write a novel. You can bullet point it out, but set out what those specific expectations are. I also like this exercise for board members, current board members, I should say, who might need a little bit of a poke to say, oh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really doing that or I'm falling down on that. Right. So it always helps to reframe your work and your mission with your current board members. Also, I think you might find that current board members might be able to say something like, you know, I think I could be more successful with this information, or I see us really achieving this mission point um, if we had this type of person in, right? I mean, I think that it, it, it's a good generative discussion that really allows you as an organization to kind of level set to understand what this looks like. If you've ever heard me speak, you know I'm a huge fan of the 10-10-10 rule. It was started by Susie, Susie Welsh, and it basically goes like this. What do you need or how is this decision going to be impacting you and your organization over the next 10 weeks, 10 months, and 10 years, right? Basically, we're saying, how do we forecast? How do we look at the future? How do we replace current board members, aging board members, board members that might take a shift in the location of where they live and work, right? These are the things that will help us to understand what these specific expectations are. Now, I'm not saying in LinkedIn you lay this all out, but I think when you start the conversation on LinkedIn, and it's not a one and done, it's got to be something that you make a commitment to and that you get your board to share and your C-suite to share. To really start that conversation of we need people that are going to be board champions. This is what we're looking for. This is where we need help. Doesn't mean you have to be perfect. Doesn't mean you have to have it all figured out. But you're looking for these types of resources and profiles. One of the things that I get asked a lot about are given gets. And especially, um, and this is a, a strategy or a I'll use the word policy, a policy uh, that a lot of nonprofit boards take. And that means you have an annual financial commitment that you need to make. And if you can't write that check, then you have to get it, which means you have to go out into the community, maybe get your employer to fund it. Maybe you throw a fundraiser, who knows, but you bring in the, a certain and specific amount to the board. This could be a little tricky when you're working with younger board members, right? So what does that look like? And how do you navigate it? I'm a big proponent of scholarshiping in that level. So for example, maybe you have a, a give or get and it's $5,000 a year. $5,000 a year is going to be a lot for somebody uh, under the age of 30. Certainly somebody starting out, even possibly up to the age of 40. And so what you can do is you can organize your board to 
support that financially, offer so many scholarships for so many years, or to people under a certain age or all three. That way you're not losing out on talent for your board just because you can't get that give or get. And when I talk to next gen board leaders, this is one of the most profound things they tell us. Julia, I would love to do this. I want to serve. I want to work, but I can't do the give or get. And then you lose all that energy and all of that goodwill and talent for something that's really minimal. You know, it's a short term problem, um, but it has a huge, huge implication. So think about that. Again, using LinkedIn to recruit with specific expectations, um, a huge opportunity and something that I think you'll find really kind of helps get the conversation started. Okay, strategy number five, neophyte inculcation. What's this mean? What does this look like? Basically, it's a fancy way of saying training get neophytes, new people inculcated, meaning you get them um, inoculated with your mission and your vision and your values and how you work and how you speak and what the policies are and what programming is. So here's the magic. We often think about board training or board onboarding. I want to challenge you to think about this differently. And that's not just for the new folks. Sure, it's important and you got to do it. It'll save yourself a lot of heartache. But this is something that you can do with everyone, right? You can do this at the beginning of every year, at the end of every year. So you start fresh. There are a lot of ways to go about this so that everybody on the board is educated about what your programming does new technologies, new approaches. You know, if you think about the trajectory of nonprofits, many of them due to the advancements of science and knowledge and information share are doing things differently. How we started with certain social issues 10, 20, 30, certainly a hundred years ago are radically changed, probably for the better, I would say. So how do we keep our members updated with this? How do they know what to be looking at? This is where training comes in. You can do it internally. You can bring somebody from the outside in. You can bring somebody in from a completely different area. I also like to think that this is a really strong piece and uh, a place for fundraising training doesn't mean that every single person on your board is going to be going out there and doing the, the, the heavy lift of fundraising, but they need to know how it works. They need to know the relationship patterns and that it's not just dialing for dollars. When you have that culture of philanthropy throughout your board and your organization, which is a whole nother topic and in a very exciting approach, um, you will become more sustainable and more successful, right? You'll have board members that are not afraid of the word fundraising and who freeze up every time they hear that or they read a report. They'll be more engaged with what is going on and understanding it. So in my mind, uh, board training is really important. It is not really just for the newbies. It is important. And don't, don't make any mistake on that but it really needs to bleed over into your existing board so that they understand. I also think strategy number five will help your older board members understand and appreciate and learn how to work with their new board members. There is nothing worse than what I like to call the boardroom eye roll, where somebody asks a question or somebody offers an opinion. And we're talking about these next gen board members. And then the older board members roll their eyes and say, oh, you know, same thing goes the other direction. If you have a, a set of younger board members and they feel like they're not connecting or working or rowing in the same direction as the older board members, you get the eye roll. But with the eye roll, you also get disengagement. This is one of the last things I want to leave with today. We know about board term limits 
and they're very important for many reasons. But younger demographics are proving out that they don't feel tied to board service like maybe older demographics do. What does that look like? That means if they feel like they're not being engaged, they have in themselves disengaged, the mission is not being achieved or worked on, it's easy for them to walk away. And when they do, it's a really tough thing for the board because then all of a sudden you have a hole that you hadn't expected to fill. So this leads me to my last pitch. And that really means that along with this training, I think you need to look at these next gen leaders. And as we, we use this phrase to determine who's next up, right? What's your strategy for determining who's going to be the next one on the bench that you can pull up to senior leadership? Who's going to take committee roles? Who's going to chair? Who's going to be a vice chair? Who do you see with a little training can ultimately become board chair? Who do you see can be an advocate who might really become great with media representation? Who's going to open the door to other investments from community leaders, thought leaders, and funders? This is your talent pool. And by keeping and retaining these folks, and nurturing them, your organization is gonna be a lot more successful. It's gonna be stable, it's gonna be secure, and you as a board steward will have really done a great job for the future of your organization. I hope this has helped. It's really fun for me to talk about this. There's a lot involved with it. As you know, if you're watching the nonprofit show with us on a regular basis or even infrequently, we get so many questions about boards. We get so many questions and frustrations seeping into the conversation about how do we steward a board? How do we govern? How do we look at the future of our organization? And so this is a really big topic, and I'm just thrilled that you could join me today in discovering and in, in really taking a look at, at what it, it, it looks like and what it could be. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. You can find me on AmericanNonprofitAcademy.com. I'm also the co-host of The Nonprofit Show. But more importantly, and most recently, I'm the author of Building Board Champions, which is really a fun way to activate impactful nonprofit board members. You can find it on Amazon. It's a quick read, put up, you know, pick up, put down. Um, it has a lot of great ideas that I like to say can be done effortlessly, low cost, um, before a meeting, during a meeting. And then there are others that are a lot deeper. They're much more strategic and will take you more time. There's also a fabulous, um, I would say kind of tool that we developed years ago and we manipulate it and massage it every year that helps you determine who, what, and why you need certain board members the talents, the areas of expertise, and it's not the usual suspects. So I hope you get to take a look at that. And hopefully uh, your board will really um, evolve and, and mature and grow into something that helps you achieve your mission, vision, and values. So again, thank you so much for joining me today. I also want to give tremendous um, thanks and gratitude to our amazing sponsors, Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, your part-time controller, Fundraisers Friday, our new show on Fridays, and the 180 Management Group. You know, as we end every episode, we leave with this message, and it's stronger than ever. And it goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. Thanks for joining me today.